Hi, we are going to do some polarity practice. So I've written down some Lewis dot structures. Um, here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the bonds. So if I only have two atoms, um, what's, what do they look like on the periodic table? Is there at least one element between them to tell me, oh, the electronegativity difference is significant enough that it would be a polar bond. Um, second, I go to, is there a lone pair on the molecule that would make it polar? And third, I'm asking, is this molecule symmetrical? Are all the substituent atoms around it the same? So even if it is a polar bond, they would all cancel out the polarities and end up being nonpolar. So those are the three things we're going to look at. Okay, I've got CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, carbon um, to an oxygen, if we just look at that bond, is going to be polar. And here's the reason why. If you notice, there's carbon, there's oxygen, nitrogen is in between. So if I was just looking at carbon monoxide, a carbon and an oxygen, I'd say, oh, that's a polar bond. The oxygen's going to be um, the partial negative and the carbon's going to be the partial positive. But notice here, we have got two oxygens. So yes, this is a polar bond, but I have two oxygens. It's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. They're both pulling equal opposite directions uh, for those electrons. So that means overall it cancels out and that is a non-polar molecule. So carbon monoxide, yeah, that is polar because the oxygen doesn't equally share electrons, um, has a greater electronegativity, but here carbon dioxide because it's symmetrical, there are two oxygens pulling in equal opposite directions for the, those polar bonds. They cancel out, it's nonpolar. Okay, let's look at this uh, nitrate ion. Um, so even with the double triple bonds, or excuse me, triple bond here, double, double, single bonds, um, those aren't going to play into the polarity significantly. We can use, still use all of our uh, regular rules. Um, so if I look at just the oxygen nitrogen, this is kind of interesting. Notice that bond nitrogen oxygen, they're right next to each other. Because they're next to each other, if I just had NO, I would say that was nonpolar. If they're close enough, their electronegativities are gonna be very similar. When you subtract and take the difference of electronegativities, they're going to share pretty equally. Um, well, in this case with nitrogen, um, I have three of the same substituent is symmetrical, so right away I would say nonpolar. So this is kind of an interesting example. Each bond I would say is nonpolar and the molecule is nonpolar. Over here I'd say the bond is polar, but the overall molecule is nonpolar. Um, okay, let's look at our phosphorus pentafluoride. Um, so again, let's look at bonds. So here's my phosphorus and there's my fluorine. So we definitely have here and here, we have the space of not only one element in between them, but also on different energy levels. So I would definitely say, yeah, that's going to be a polar bond between phosphorus and fluorine. But looking at the overall molecule, it's symmetrical. This molecule is going to be nonpolar. Each of those fluorines pulling in equal opposite directions are going to cancel each other out for the polarity. So nonpolar molecule. Now, if you're ever just asked, hey, is this polar or nonpolar? It's referring to the molecule. You have to specifically be asked if the bond is polar or nonpolar. And I've seen those questions. I've seen those questions where a student will be asked, um, is the bond polar and is the molecule polar? Um, but if you're just asked, is it polar? They're referring to the overall molecule. Um, okay, I put benzene here. Wanted to remind you that benzene is just carbon and hydrogen. Each of those um, little vertices represent carbon and each carbon is going to have one hydrogen coming off of it. So as a reminder, carbon and hydrogen, nonpolar. So all of this, just carbon and hydrogen bonds, nonpolar. Anytime you have those hydrocarbons, nonpolar. Now, if you add oxygen to it, nitrogen to it, that's going to change. Um, but if it's just carbon and hydrogen, nonpolar or in regardless of double, single, triple bonds. Okay, we have a xenon trioxide. Um, so kind of fun, the xenon does a covalent bond with three of the oxygens. I look at the central atom, remember. Um, so xenon and oxygen, I would say that that is a polar bond. The oxygen will attract the electrons, um, if they ask me about bonds. 
But looking at the molecule, there should be something that really grabs you. It's that lone pair. I see a lone pair on the central atom. Boom, we're done. That is a polar molecule. Love it when I see lone pairs on central atoms because then I'm done. Um, okay, sulfur dioxide. Again, I'm hoping you see this and you go, oh, I see it right off. It's that lone pair on the central atom. Don't even have to think about the, the bonds. That lone pair on the central atom is going to make that polar. Now, if you're asked about the bonds, let's look at it. Sulfur and oxygen. Notice, same group right next to each other. I would say sulfur and oxygen. The bond is nonpolar because they're right next to each other. The electronegativity difference is going to be very similar. They'll share pretty evenly. Um, okay, T-shaped. Check this out, five electron domains. One, two, three, four, five. Um, so chlorine has three bonds and two lone pairs this time. So we have the partial negative on this side and that whole side will be the partial positive. That is going to be polar. Oh, and let me add here. Wherever you have your lone pair, that's going to be your partial negative. Everything else will be partial positive. Partial negative, partial positive. Um, okay, now we have this boron trifluoride. So if we look at just the bonds, if you're asked, is the bond polar or nonpolar? So there's boron, here's fluorine. Wow, definitely polar. We have, what, three elements in between. So there will be a significant difference in electronegativity, so much so, it'll probably really be ionic, um, but we'll pretend <laughs> it's covalent for this example. Um, so definitely I'd say a polar bond, um, but looking at polarity of the molecule, it's symmetrical. All of the bonds, or all of the atoms, are the same. They're all fluorine. So pulling in equal opposite directions, those fluorines aren't sharing, they're attracting the electrons. So it's going to cancel out and overall make that molecule nonpolar. So I hope that practice helped you. Um, again, if I'm looking just at the bond, that's when I go to the periodic table. If there's at least one element between the two atoms that I'm comparing, um, and that could be going across the period or down the group, then I say it's polar. And here's the justification, because the electronegativity difference is great enough that the electrons will not share equally. Okay, now then when I'm looking at my molecules, you go to the central atom, number one, is there a lone pair? If there's a lone pair, we are done, it's polar. The only two exceptions to that are square planar from the six electron domain octahedral electron geometry and, um, let's see here, linear for the uh, trigonal bipyramidal five electron domain. So those are the only two exceptions, linear and square planar. Um, otherwise, if you see a lone pair or lone pairs on the central atom, it's polar. Last thing that you look at is symmetry. Do you have all the same atoms around that central atom? The central atom has no lone pairs. Then automatically, it doesn't matter if the bond's polar or nonpolar, automatically it will be nonpolar. Make that a schematic, the hierarchy of how you look at, um, at Lewis dot structures to figure out polarity. Lone pairs, symmetry, lone pairs, symmetry. And if there's only two atoms or they're looking for bonds, you go to the periodic table, is there at least one element in between them? That should give you a really good start. Uh, well, have a great day. If you have any other questions, um, you can watch the videos on bond polarity and molecular po polarity. Okay, good luck, have a good day.